one artist had a decisive influence on the poster artwork of the French Art Nouveau, the Czech painter Alphonse Mucha, who was born in 1860. Mucha came from a humble rural background. After several rejections by the Prague Academy, he went to Paris to study art at the age of 28. His Paris studio was both a place of work and a chamber of wonders. Well, Mucha lived for more than 20 years in Paris as a bachelor. Uh. Geraldine, the daughter-in-law of Alphonse Mucha, moved to Prague after the Second World War, newly wed to Mucha's son, Jerzy. Here she lives, surrounded by objects from Mucha's studio. She manages his estate. Alphonse Mucha, he wasn't a collector at all, but uh, if he saw something he liked, if he had money, he bought it. He never had any money, of course. <laughs> some of the things are, in fact, quite valuable, but some of it is of no value at all, or no particular value. Theatre played a major role in Paris at the end of the century. The trend was set by the actress Sarah Bernhardt with her expressive, dramatic performances. She needed a poster for a revival of a play called Gismonda. And the printing firm had no artists available because they were all on holiday, it was just before Christmas. And the only person there was Mucha, who was proofing some prints for a friend. So having no choice, he was asked to do a poster. There was enormous pressure on the artist who had to design a poster for La Bernard. Perhaps this expectation gave rise to the creative inspiration to revolutionize poster design. The dimensions were determined by the lithographic stone used for printing at that time. But Mucha drew two narrow sections, side by side, which were then joined together to form a slender, erect figure. He did posters that were two meters tall, tall enough to be the size of a human being. Many of Mucha's posters were placed so that they were at eye level. And as you walked the street, you came eye to eye with a Mucha poster. Mucha's posters quickly became collector's items. As soon as they were pasted up, the fans peeled them off again. Sarah Bernhardt was thrilled. Mucha had portrayed her as she saw herself, slender, young, and above all, highly visible. In return, she placed Mucha under contract for five years. From now on, he designed her costumes, her jewelry, and some of the sets for her plays. Sarah Bernhardt also used Mucha's posters on tour, which spread his fame as far as America. The poster style that had been made popular by artists like Toulouse-Lautrec, with few lines and strongly contrasting colors, had been superseded. Amorphous flowing forms became the hallmark both of Mucha and Art Nouveau. His perfection of this style was so complete that people called it Le Style Mucha. Man was, does not exist in Art Nouveau. If he exists, he is a supporter. Uh, he is um, in the background most of the time. Arnouveau basically 
depends on a woman because she has all the necessary ingredients. Profile, long hair. It is the hair that makes the woman attractive and beautiful. And Muha, of course, used the hair almost like a creature in its own right. Tendrils go down and they entwine in itself and they go around the body in and around sections. They become part of the lettering in, in a poster. The hair plays an incredibly important part. And men at that time did not have long hair, so they were already uh, out of the picture. While the general public loved him, his critics often described the cascades of hair in his posters as macaroni hair. After all, the poster is meant to attract, isn't it? And, and of course, his women are very attractive. They're sort of sexy without being vulgar, which, which is a very, uh, they do attract. And after all, what's the poster for? I studied to be a composer. I'm actually a graduate from the Royal Academy of Music in London. Well, I've been writing music all my life, so what could I do? fortunate because both my parents are very musical. My father noticed that I sat down at the piano and improvised more or less as soon as I could sit up. very Czech, well, from Moravia, a certain part of what became Czechoslovakia, but you have to remember it was all the Austrian Empire. After his first successes in Paris, Mucha quickly became a darling of society. It was, however, a superficial relationship. After 20 years in Paris, in which he rose from being an unknown painter to the greatest poster graphic artist, he was still yearning for Czechia. At the age of 46, he fell in love with a young art student, Marie Chitilova. They married in a Czech village instead of having a grand wedding in Paris. The invention of the electric light set the tone in Mucha's Paris at the turn of the century. Twinkling lights on the Eiffel Tower and cascades of light on all the city sites. That was the new style. No idea seemed impossible at the time. If Mucha could have shortened the Eiffel Tower by two thirds, tourists to Paris would be able to photograph this Mucha building today. The movie camera was invented. Cars, airships and elevators dominated the cities. The dream of an easy life began. Fantastic innovations were presented at the Paris World Exhibition, like the two-speed electric walkway. And so it was extremely uh, avant-garde in one sense, but at the same time, you had a tremendous amount of interest in symbolist art, symbolist painting, and with it, 
went interest in uh, Freemasonry, um, uh, talking to the dead. Moore was absolutely fascinated by the occult. Mucha was open to all these trends. He experimented with film, became a Freemason, and held seances. He photographed uh, one mystic woman who was taken over by the spirits of the dead, which were images and positions which he used later on in many drawings. Here in his late work, The Slav Epic, we again find these forms of expression, but in a context far removed from pulsating Paris. The painting The Slavs in their land of origin shows a peasant couple in the foreground. For Mucha, they embody pacifism and purity, whilst in the background, enemy hordes are advancing. The oversized heathen god figure symbolizes the power of faith over the power of arms. The picture is an allegory of the suppression of the Slavs. The här programmet presenterades av Viasat History, bringing history to life. Julen på TV8 presenteras av den nya naturliga maltmisken, The Glenlivet Nadura. Just nu pågår Onoffs stora mellandagsrea med superlåga priser på utvalda märkesvaror. Kom in till butiken eller se julens alla klipp på onoff.se. Precis som alltid kan vi hjälpa till med hemleverans och installation. Svenska Dagbladet hela helgen. Fredag, lördag och söndag. Visst är det gulligt med barn som hjälper till hemma? Eller som plockar äpplen hos grannen om man nu har en granne med ett äppelträd vill säga. Eller som drygar ut veckopengen med att sälja jultidningar eller tulpaner som jag själv gjorde. Men det finns barn som arbetar för att överleva. För att deras familjer ska överleva. Då är det inte lika gulligt längre. Eller hur? Det finns över 120 miljoner barn som arbetar heltid. 120 miljoner barn som aldrig får vara just det. Barn. Och många av dem får heller aldrig uppleva hur det är att bli vuxen. UNICEF gör någonting åt det här. Varje dag. Överallt. Nu har du ett val. Antingen gör du ingenting. Eller så gör du någonting. Bet 24 Casino just nu. 6 miljoner i samlade jackpotar som bara väntar på att vi hämtar det. Det är toppen. Bet24.com. More action. More fun. Äntligen här. Linuslotta.com. Internetbutiken med bra kläder för busiga barn. Linuslotta.com. Linuslotta har sköna, funktionella barnkläder för både stora och små. Handla trendiga plagg hemifrån när det passar dig utan stress. Linuslotta.com Just nu har vi upp till halva priset på utvalda kläder. Klicka in på linuslotta.com. Barnkläder på internet. Köp Sex and the City, The Movie. På stereon.com Nya dubbelseden Lugna favoriter 2008. En dubbel CD med 32 låtar. Köp den på cdon.com. En dubbel CD till enkel pris.
Efter en intensiv höst är tomten nu på solsemester. I hans frånvaro har vi Viasat tagit fram årets klapp, Viasat Plus. Boxen som låter dig bestämma när julens alla filmer ska börja. Byt till Viasat nu och få Viasat Plus hårddiskbox för 0 kronor samt tre frimånader på hela vårt utbud. Ring 0200 219 219. God jul önskar Viasat. Gymgrossisten.com För dig som tar din idrott på allvar. Vi är norra Europas största leverantör av kosttillskott. Gymgrossisten.com Nu är det vinterrea på Stereon.com Guns N' Roses Greatest Hits Batman Begins What you really fear is inside you. Nokia 2760 Hörlurar från WSC. Gitarr Hero 3 inklusive två gitarrer. Tusentals prissänkta produkter på cdon.com. Hej älskling, halsbränna igen mm. Druck i vatten Ja Här, ta en Renny Ta så ofta du behöver Renny ger snabb och effektiv lindring vid halsbränna och sur mage Genom att neutralisera magsyrorna Bättre? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Renny, ta så ofta du behöver presenteras av den nya naturliga maltmisken med glänglivet när dörren. Det här programmet presenterades av Viasat History. Bringing history to life. Slavic popular art had a lasting influence on Mucha and was already a source of inspiration for the graphic art of his posters. His Paris studio was always a popular meeting place for fellow Czechs and other artists. His good friend Paul Gauguin is playing the harmonium. His harmonium, his special love, He even took the harmonium with him to America, you know, across the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> what? Well, I don't know. You see, I don't know what... I don't know the technique of it. So I think... Wait a minute, I think maybe... Well, I don't know what you have to do. But anyway, you have to pedal like that. So that... <laughs> Mucha, with his huge talent, was soon looking for new challenges. He completely decorated the jewellery shop of the Parisian goldsmith Georges Fouquet. It's now in the collection of the Musée Carnavalet, but not on display. From the fountains to the fabric wall coverings, from the floor mosaic to the sculptures, and even the jewellery, everything was designed by Mucha. The long-standing working relationship between Fouquet and Mucha resulted from the snake bracelet that Sarah Bernhardt saw on the poster for Medea. She wanted to wear it during public appearances. Mucha designed it and Fouquet made it. Also die 
It was like this. Everyone has a Mocha calendar or has at least seen one, right? And even if some people don't know what his name is, they know his pictures. And I had already seen the Four Seasons as a child, classic. Then other posters at a friend's, huge posters, beautiful. So I just had to have a Mocha. And then we saw Medea and that struck me like a blow. That moment, the way she's standing there, the red sun around her, the look in her eyes, oh God, at the realization, I'm getting goose pimples of what she had just done. She had murdered her own children. The blood is still dripping. It was quite heavy for me. I don't think it's really a typical picture for him because he normally always, well not always, but tended more towards those lovely flowery things. In Berlin tattoo circles, Mucha is very well known. His folds and waves and forceful swirls are appropriate for tattoos. He could not have foreseen that his work would be used for this purpose, but his aim was that his motifs should be copied. With the document décoratif, Mucha created a book of designs. The document décoratif was meant to make art accessible to a wider public than just the privileged classes. As far as I know, it's really probably the first, call it designer Bible. And that's exactly what it was meant for. It was be designers or even non-designers would buy it, it would give people idea perhaps how to furnish their house because you have designs of furniture, carpets, everything. Um, it's really up to you. You can, you, know, you, can, you can copy the pages exactly or you can just take a small element and do something with it. But essentially it's all about design. He thought it would give him less work and in fact it gave him more work because people, everybody bought the book. And the, but they wanted, like the one in the book, but just a little different. Mm. Yes, the original, maybe the original idea, but his whole, he definitely uh, thought everything should be properly designed, mm. everything that everybody uses every day, that it should really be a nice design. That, that, that's the basis of mm. it, definitely. Mm. This attitude arose from the main objective of Art Nouveau, to permeate all facets of daily life with art. Merlin is a Berlin leather artist who makes punched leather accessories for motorbikes. He often uses Mucha motifs in his more personal work. He's the master of the line and I need a line with leather because I have to engrave the leather and then punch it, otherwise I don't get these structures. Mucha was predestined for this. His lines are so clear, you can do wonderful work with them, at least I can. This is from the Byzantine heads, Le Brunette. I've left the hair colour out so that the leather works by itself and is only accentuated by coloured crystal stones. 
His decoration, just a few effects to liven it up, so that the effect is not just the bare leather, but has little highlights in it. The women are feminine, something soft about them. He always portrayed his women like that, in that he accentuated the feminine character. At the beginning of 1900, at the height of his success, Mucha began to suffer doubts. Until now, he'd put all his artistic energy into the idealization of the Western woman, but his soul belonged to the Slavic people. He saw how they lived under Austro-Hungarian rule or suffered under the Russian czars. It became increasingly obvious to him that he had to return to his Czech homeland. Mucha had inwardly withdrawn from the colorful world he'd created in his posters. After 20 years, he turned his back on Paris forever. He just wanted to be a painter. He wanted to paint a gigantic epic for his people. But before he could do this, he had to make some money. Sarah Bernhardt knew how and where he could earn a fortune. In 1906, Alphonse Mucha closed his Paris studio and full of optimism boarded a ship bound for America. In New York, he planned to make lots of money by painting portraits of millionaires' wives. The New York Daily News marked the occasion of his arrival with a seven-page special edition. Mucha was already very well known in America because of the stage diva Sarah Bernhardt, but only for his posters. The anticipated success as a portrait artist did not materialize. So Mucha had to look around for a new source of income. Then he met Charles R. Crane, the son of an American industrialist. Thomas Crane, his grandson, visited Geraldine Mucha in her house in the Prague Harachin. <laughs> yes, well, I am a musician, you see. <laughs> so you... So, no, I, I write, I don't perform, I write music. <laughs> Charles R. Crane travelled halfway around the world and supported political liberation movements. That's how he met Tomasz G. Mazarek, the future president of the Czechoslovakian Republic. Crane was filled with enthusiasm for the Slavic idea. There were a lot of Slavophils in America. Right. Your grandfather was one of them, of course. Right. And the Slavophils gave a banquet to support the Russians. I and see. Alphonse was invited to that banquet. Uh -huh. And he got up, Alphonse, and, and kind of suggested forming some kind of an American Slav society or something. Uh -huh. And that was what attracted your grandfather. I see. Uh, who is this young man from Europe, you see, right. with this idea? Uh -huh. And he actually passed him his visiting card. I see. The next, the following Christmas, after he'd uh, opened his heart right. to Charles Crane, um, a telegram arrived and it said contact Williams uh, this was your Roger Williams that's his, his uh, personal uh, well secretary. contact Williams and the first check arrived uh -huh. after his finances were secured Mucha was able to return to his Czech homeland forever he took up residence in the old castle of Zbiro one hour from Prague accompanied by his wife Marushka and their children Jerzy and Jaroslava Mucha immediately set about preparing to work on the cycle of paintings. Mucha and Crane agreed that upon its completion, the Slav epic would be presented to the city of Prague. Prague accepted the gift and the condition that a suitable exhibition building should be constructed. To this day, this has not been done.
Geraldine Mucha visited the Slav epic in the castle of Moravsky Krumlo, where it's been exhibited since 1963. It comprises 20 paintings that depict the important events of Slavic history. The abolition of serfdom in Russia. The printing of the Kralik Bible in Ivanchitsa. The Bulgarian Tsar Simeon. After the Battle of Grunwald. The Omladina youth taking their vows under the Slavonic linden tree. Meeting at Krishki the last days of Jan Amos Komensky, the apotheosis of the Slavs. The pictures were hidden from the Nazis in 1937 and only rediscovered by the Mucha family 25 years later. No, it was rolled up and hidden, and that probably saved it after all. But at the end of the war, nobody knew where these enormous canvases were. And uh, it wasn't until the late 50s that uh, they turned up in this castle. The moment we heard about it, we came down to see if it really was so. <laughs> and um, there was a little man in charge who was an employee of the railways. Yiri, my husband, explained that uh, there might be a painting and one of them was unrolled. And the reason I remember it so well was the uh, effect on this ordinary man. He was just speechless. He simply couldn't believe what he saw. He was standing there. I thought he was gonna burst into tears. He just could not believe it. They roll round these huge rollers, and uh, in fact, that's how they were stored. And when they were unrolled, they were hardly damaged at all. They work like the sails of a ship. They've got um, ropes sort of fitted in down the sides, and you sit, they simply uh, go up and down like the sails of a ship. One of the paintings is dedicated to his hometown of Ivanchitsa, a town near the current exhibition site Moravsky Krumlo. The first translation of the Bible into Czech was made in Ivanchitsa. Mucha never forgot this historical event. He consulted historians and dictionaries, and he just, well, anything he didn't know, he immediately looked it up or else consulted somebody. Well, he was so uh, particular about the details of, for these pictures, all through pictures, and he was determined to get all the details right. And for instance, you can't find a fault in the costumes, the weapons, the furniture, uh, even the bits of embroidery. He went all through the Balkans, as it right. was then, uh, what became Yugoslavia, you see, right. and uh, making sketches, he, he went uh, either on foot or on mule or whatever was available with his camera <laughs> right. as well sometimes. On his travels, Mucha observed the people and the milieu, as in this scene from Russia. 
At the beginning of the 20th century, the idea of pan-Slavism was popular among educated Slavs, Western Europeans and Americans. Pan-Slavists like Charles R. Crane and Tomasz G. Mazarik believed that Slavic culture was superior to Western culture. This inspired Mucha to paint the abolition of serfdom in Russia in 1861. And his plan was that this would be a very happy, celebratory sort of painting because their liberation had a symbolic value for the potential freeing of all Slavic people. So imagine his surprise when he got to Moscow on a study trip in 1913 and discovered a backward country full of ignorant and superstitious serfs. He then began to put together small first sketches of the scene of the whole canvas. In the case of the abolition, he initially did a sketch that was about 10 centimeters square that captured a view of the entire canvas. From that, he proceeded to a sketch of the kind that I'm holding now. He did this in watercolor and gouache. The preliminary works already reached an extremely high level of perfection, but for Mucha, they were no more than draft designs. Mucha wrote in a Prague art magazine, the process of composition must take place solely in the imagination. Thereafter, it's necessary to harmonize light and shadow and to determine everything about each figure down to the movement of the little finger. He proceeded to use tracing paper, taking one section of the proposed canvas at a time and tracing out on paper with grids like graph paper. Tiny holes were put along the lines of the drawing on the tracing paper. The paper was placed against the canvas and charcoal was blown through those holes so that we ended up with a kind of connect the dots process on the canvas itself. From there, he applied egg tempera as the basic medium. And in most of the canvases, the final details were put on with oil. Before painting the enormous canvases, Mucha had his sketches meticulously staged by models with costumes and props. The whole village of Zbiro modeled for him. The villagers embodied the scenes with such enthusiasm, there was often no need for Mucha to adapt their gestures and facial expressions. Mucha arranged the themes of the Slav epic so that 10 of the canvases are devoted to Czech topics and the other 10 to other Slavic culture. The cult of Svantovit portrays the expulsion of the Slavs from the Baltic island of Rügen. They had resisted Christianity right up to the 12th century. Arcona, on the rocky heights of the island, was the stronghold of the cult of the heathen god Svantovit until the Teutonic tribes came. Thor and his wolves, leading the marauders who will in time entirely destroy this glorious northern Slav culture. Below, on the plane of reality, we see the festival in full swing. In the middle of that happy scene is a young Slav mother with a look of anxiety, almost as if in premonition of these sad events to come. 
when the gods are at war, salvation lies in the arts. The Bohemian King Podibrad received an envoy from the Pope. Rome exerted pressure on the Bohemians because, as Hussites, they'd abandoned the Catholic Church. Mucha was euphoric when he wrote to Charles Crane, the whole of Prague is buzzing with excitement and looking for the best solution for exhibiting the epic. From this end, success is certain. In 1910, the municipal house in Prague was to be decorated. Mucha, the irrepressible patriot, made an offer to the city to do the whole job. My grandfather basically, when the whole he knew the architect, Polivka, and he offered to, to uh, decorate the entire building. Uh, For free? Well, I think he asked the city that they would provide the paint and yes, all those things, but, but basically he did it for free, absolutely. And there was an outcry among the other artists saying, who is this man? He lived in Paris. Who does he think he is suddenly coming in? Come on. In the end, Alphonse Mucha was only allowed to decorate the Lord Mayor's Hall, and the other rooms were assigned to other Czech artists. When Alphonse Mucha returned to his native land, uh, he had a house built for himself. And that was a very nice house. That's where I lived when I first came here. We all lived there, his, his wife, my sister-in-law, everybody. And then the communists took that house for a diplomat. So we had to move out. The fact that we had the complete inheritance from Alphonse Mucha saved us at that point. From the 1950s, the Mucha family was seen as an enemy of the regime and suffered reprisals. The government did not directly attack the internationally known works of Alphonse Mucha, but under socialism, his art was regarded as decadent and bourgeois and was not exhibited to the public. There's nowhere to see Mucha's work in the public galleries. And people got to know that we had everything. And so they started coming here. That's how it began. But the uh, people who were left in these small flats with no privacy, young people, you see, they started coming here just to have privacy. Girls brought their boyfriends or boys brought their girlfriends because they could be private here. Come in. You see, now here's my mother-in-law, actually, Marush. <coughs> He had no success with portraits. He couldn't flatter. Mm. So no, no flattery, no success. Mm. Um, it's Gauguin, 
in the studio in Paris. Mm. The life in Paris. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. At the time, <laughs> yes. In your best clothes. That's good guy. Well, he's playing. There's the harmonium. You see there. I know it doesn't move easily. This is my husband, uh, Yiri. He's also the biographer of his father because he was an author here, very well known. In 1950, Yerji was sentenced to six years hard labor in a Stalinist show trial. My husband was arrested and then he was in prison and then I didn't know where he was and, oh no, and, uh, well, there are in all these things. But it's, uh, everybody here, you see, has had a life like that. It's, it's nothing unusual. It's just, as I say, I'm fortunate to be a composer. I realize that that is what has kept me sane, providing that I am sane, of course. <laughs> That's another. No, I don't think I would have survived this long if I hadn't. I'm sure I wouldn't. If I, but no, because it's concentration. You see, everything is awful. So you, you, you create something and you've got it. Det här programmet presenterades av Viasat History, bringing history to life. Julen på TV8 presenteras av den nya naturliga maltwhiskyn, The Glenlivet Nadura. Vår största mellandagsrea någonsin fortsätter. Elgiganten prispressar och lagret fylls hela tiden med märkesvaror till fantastiska priser. Så missa inte mellandagsrean alla talar om. Skaffa en häftig Walkman-mobil från Sony Ericsson för otroliga 990. Eller en 17-tums laptop från Toshiba för bara 4 990. Spara 1000. Välkommen till Elgiganten. Största rea någonsin. En kraftfull laptop med 256 MB grafik och 4 GB intern minne för bara 5990. Spar 2000. Eller en extern hårddisk på hela 1000 GB för endast 990. Ses på rea redan idag. Här behövs ingen hockeyfrilla. Noll bingo. Noll jidder. Noll invecklade VIP-program. Här är bara 30% rakeback åt alla från första satsade krona. Kojak Poker. Lagling skattefri poker. För alla kungar och näktar. Se allt från Champions League. I Sveriges enda renodlade fotbollskanal. Kanalen med 100% fotboll. Vi har satt fotboll. En passion, en kanal. Gymgrossisten.com För dig som tar din idrott på allvar. Gymgrossisten.com Den tionde svenska idrottsskalan. Sveriges största idrottshjältar finns på plats när årets stjärnor ska hyllas i Globen den 19 januari. Svenska idrottsskalan 2009. Boka dina vippaket och biljetter nu på 0771 31 000 000. Just nu pågår Onoffs stora mellandagsrea med superlåga priser på utvalda märkesvaror. Kom in till butiken 
eller se julens alla klipp på onoff.se. Precis som alltid kan vi hjälpa till med hemleverans och installation. Det finns över 120 miljoner barn som arbetar heltid. 120 miljoner barn som aldrig får vara just det, barn. Och många av dem får heller aldrig uppleva hur det är att bli vuxen. UNICEF gör någonting åt det här varje dag, överallt. Nu har du ett val. Antingen gör du ingenting, eller så gör du någonting. What's your threat? Julen på TV8 presenteras av den nya naturliga maltmisken med glänlivet när dörr. Det här programmet presenterades av Viasat History, bringing history to life. Mucha expressed his personal doubts and emotions in pastel drawings over many years. He never showed them to anybody. They were never seen. They were seen for the first time in 1994 as an exhibition. And <laughs> for the first time, they, nobody ever saw them. If Mucha had exhibited his pastels in 1900, he would surely have been regarded as part of the avant-garde. But Mucha was searching for a clear, unequivocal form of expression and did not trust the suggestive power of his pastels. My mother-in-law always said that he wanted people to understand what he was painting. And she, she said that they were, it wasn't clear what he meant. That's what she said. That's why he didn't show them. It's not clear. <laughs> These days, the pastels are being shown at exhibitions all over the world as here in the Bröhan Museum in Berlin. During the Cold War, there were constant inquiries about the posters from museums in the West, but it was extremely difficult for the Mucha family to get these works out of the country. In addition to his other sources of inspiration, Alphonse was deeply moved throughout his career by Freemasonry. He first became a Mason when he entered a Masonic lodge in the 1890s during his career as a graphic artist in Paris, ultimately becoming the highest official in masonry in Czechoslovakia. Symbols of Freemasonry permeate the whole of Mucha's work. He was convinced that symbols have an immediate effect on the beholder and that Slavic cultures in particular had a strong response to symbols. The cycle of paintings was divided into four themes, culture, allegory, religion, and military. In the battle scenes, either the build-up to the battle or the aftermath are depicted. Showing the carnage of the battle was contrary to Mucha's humanistic views. One quality about the painting that is the strange attention to the portrayal of naked bodies with about the maximum amount of nudity that an artist in that period would have been permitted. And with a kind of glistening and even erotic quality 
that seems inconsistent and incongruent with a battlefield scene. And even though the canvases depict really fairly grisly scenes, they have a kind of contemplative quality about them. It's as though Mukha wanted us to have a meditation on the consequences and wages of war. Glorified nationalism is the most common criticism directed at Mukha's epic. In 1918, after the First World War, the common goal of Alphonse Mukha, Tomasz G. Masaryk and Charles R. Crane was achieved. Independence from Austro-Hungarian rule. Masaryk became president of the newly founded Czechoslovakian Republic. Mukha designed postage stamps and banknotes, and Crane's daughter modeled for them. The first odd thing is this is a portrait of an American, but it's titled Slavia. And to me, it's a perfect uh, bringing together of uh, my family, the Muka family, <laughs> and the uh, role in the uh, uh, Czech government. In 1928, the epic was presented to the city in the industrial palace of the Prague Exhibition Center and put on temporary display. Today, the city is planning a permanent exhibition in this building. The gallery on the first floor is to be expanded and the Slav epic installed there. But trade fairs will continue to be held in the rooms. The agreement of 1910 to house the paintings in a specially constructed building, which has not been met to this day, is also under consideration by the city of Prague. The reception was mixed and as time progressed it became within certain what I would call artistic, intellectual, bureaucratic circles it became almost actively hostile. I think essentially the, the, the view of these people was that poor old Alphonse, he lost his way and he should really, he should have stuck to his posters and he would have been fine. He was accused of being unnecessarily nationalistic, harking for the past, um, not just in terms of the subject matter, but also in the execution. Um, I mean, it was old fashioned way of painting and so on. The nationalism that the Czechs saw in the pictures was of little interest to the Americans. They valued them as works of art and exhibited five of the paintings in 1921. The fact of the exhibition itself was extraordinary because by 1921, Art Nouveau, with which Alphonse had always been associated, was not only passe, but well past passe. But the success of the exhibition exceeded anybody's possible expectations. 600,000 people attended. And the critical acclaim from the experts in America was uniformly glowing almost to the point of embarrassment. In Czechoslovakia, it was only the people of Moravsky Krumlo who, out of personal interest, preserved the paintings and exhibited them for many decades. It's an arduous journey to get there, three and a half hours by car from Prague. No publicity, no bus service, no signposts. International interest in the work is growing, however. A few tour operators make stopovers on the way from Prague to Vienna. The Japanese have been big fans of Mucha for a long time and like to show their appreciation. There are long-standing official inquiries from France and Rotterdam about borrowing the paintings. But the city of Prague remains silent. There appears to be a deep-seated fear about putting Mucha's life work on public display. But the time has come to open up 
and leave it to the international community to assess the art of Alphonse Mucha in its entirety. We need to re-examine Alphonse Mucha, and there's no better place to do it than with the Slav epic. And we need to understand two things. The first is that he is not primarily a decorative artist. Mucha died in 1939 at the age of 79. Alphonse Mucha was essentially a spiritual painter. He had a message, individuals and nations to grow need to be true to their roots. They need to grow organically from an understanding of where they came from and what they are. Mucha's vision was far more universal than any narrow-minded nationalism. As he wrote, the main aim of our endeavors is to Americanize the Slavic world to acquire those practical elements that make the Americans such dangerous competitors in the world. The character, the honesty, the civil liberty. At the same time, to help the Americans become more Slavic through the influence of our poetics, our sensibility and sincerity. Programmet presenterades av Viasat History, bringing history to life. Julen på TV8 presenteras av den nya naturliga maltmisken, The Glenlivet Nadura. Sivas stora mellandagsrea fortsätter. Kom in och finna Xus 85, supersmidig digitalkamera med knivskarp upplösning på 10 megapixel för endast 1495 kronor. Varmt välkommen till närmaste varuhus eller siba.se. Hos oss får du råd. Premiär för nya Audi Q5. Perfekt synkroniserat.